subscription just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? everyone and welcome to an episode of the time shifters podcast this is your host christopher with my awesome co-host tom tom how are you apparently i'm awesome <laughs> well you didn't know well you know it's good to hear once in a while you know you feel a little underappreciated from time to time moving through life it's good to hear it i'll make sure to mention it at least uh, every few episodes Woo-hoo! Crazy uh, busy kind of past couple weeks. I haven't been watching a ton of stuff or anything. Uh, one thing I did watch, and I watched this with a little bit of anticipation, hope, thinking it might be kind of fun. I watched Dracula 3D from 2012. Okay. It's also known as Argento's Dracula. Okay. This was directed by Dario Argento, the Italian uh, filmmaker known for things like uh, Suspiria okay. and that sort of thing. Yeah. This film was awful. <laughs> no, please tell tell me more about how you feel about it. <laughs> it was overlit. It was totally unimaginative. And the fact that this came from the same person that brought us the over stylized Suspiria, mm-hmm. I I honestly I felt like this looked more like a Charles Band film oh, than a Dario Argento. Okay. It's just it's really so disappointing. The actors weren't all that entertaining. Rudger Howard shows up as Van Helsing. I was kind of looking forward to that, but to take it, that yeah. didn't go well either. <laughs> yeah, not as not as well as you might hoped. Apparently, it was the first time that uh, Argento would worked in 3D. Um, perhaps that was the problem, and maybe he should have just not. Well, let me pause you. Let me pause you there. Then, um, was there a reason to do it in 3D? Did they try to take advantage of 3D? You could see where they did. They had like the 3D gimmicks. It really felt like it, any, any 3D effects was sort of the, the gimmick where a thing would something would be thrown at you, you okay. know, or a, a spear, or a sword, um, you know, the, the fangs would come out. And, and maybe in 3D it would be a little fun just because of where you the 3D was used. Yeah. But lots of um, mediocre to poor uh, CGI uh, when the vampires would die and stuff like that. And I I was just disappointed of how bright the entire film was. That's what you want out of your uh, vampire film is lots of bright scenery. Yeah, exactly. I mean, no no dark rooms, no, no... Jump from the shadows, nothing, because everything looks like it's lit by a damn sun. <laughs> <Ew>. <laughs> so it's basically, like, all all vampires should be bursting into flames just by being <laughs> in the film. Yeah, just because they're well. So so should the humans, just because it's a freaking arc light or whatever in the room. <laughs> Everyone is sunburned. <laughs> Yeah, no, I just I couldn't believe how disappointing it was. I mean, it would have been different if it was if it was just a mediocre or bad film from any other director. But the fact that this was Dario Argento, and like this is the best you can do. And, and what's interesting again, I haven't laid eyes on this one, so I, I don't know. So I'm uh, I'm talking off my ass here, but uh, it, it's just kind of funny to hear. This was a 2012 film, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So to hear the more 70s style 3D element used in a 2012 film seems bizarre. And I don't know, maybe I'm a little bit more prudish than uh, than I thought, but I still find it a little strange to have your daughter appear fully nude in your films. Yeah, yeah. I kind of, I'm kind of there with you. That seems like a line. Another film I watched, though, speaking of shadows... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice segue. 
I watched a film from 1937 last night. Uh, I was just in the mood for something, you know, I get in the mood for something from the 30s, 40s, and they're typically a little shorter, so this was only a little over an hour. So right. I'm like, ah, oh, this, this is perfect. I watched The Shadow Strikes, and this was indeed supposedly based, you know, this is The Shadow, Lamont Cranston, the whole nine yards. Mm-hmm. And The Shadow's really not in the film. <laughs> Uh, you always gotta love that. <laughs> he appears for a few minutes in the beginning and a few minutes, few minutes in the end, and the rest is just Lamont Cranston pretending to be somebody else. Okay. To solve this, solve a, a, a mystery, and it's just this kind of weird murder mystery about, uh, you know, a will and beneficiaries and things like that. Mm-hmm. The whole, the shadow seems like it was like an afterthought. And the really strange thing was like, it, it, there was like an afterthought to the afterthought where they had like this throwaway lines about the uh, actual origin of why Lamont Cranston became the shadow. The one thing that you would have actually looked for them to latch onto and have some fun with and they throw it away. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the film opens with Lamont uh, musing over a, with a magnifying glass, a, a, an old bullet. Yeah. And, you know, saying that apparently this was the bullet that killed his father. And, you know, someday he, he wants to find, a, you know, a bullet that matches. Because then he would know, you know, the gun that fired it and who, who who killed his father and everything. Okay, that's interesting. Goes absolutely nowhere through the rest of the film. <laughs> Until the very, very end, uh-huh. his butler hands him a bullet. It's like, I, I pulled this from, the, there's, a, there's a shootout from one of the crime bosses or something like that. He's like, you know, I pulled this from the wall. I thought it would be of interest to you and hands him the bullet. And then he, he walks away and the shadow, you see him like, look at this bullet and look at this bullet. Doesn't actually say anything. And he looks up and sees that the, the, the butler is walking out with his shadow hat and coat and going, where, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I thought I would throw it away. And then he's, Lamont turns to the camera and says, no, keep it. There may be another time when the, we will need the shadow. And that's the end of the film. <laughs> so I, I get what I guess you were trying to say is, oh, he finally found the man that killed his father. Yeah. But it has zero to do with <laughs> it's like, what the hell? <laughs> Didn't bother to tie any of that into the overarching story or maybe lead you onto a path to turning this into more like a serial. Right. No, nothing. Fun. Nothing at all. Sounds satisfying. <laughs> it was just a little bizarre. <laughs> the The whole mystery and everything was, was okay. There was a couple twists and turns, but it was even the end of the film and the, the movie's over and everything. And I... I I asked my wife, like, wait a minute, did we ever find out who killed the guy? And I'm like, oh, okay, I guess it was, it was supposed to be the, the, <laughs> that guy at the very end. It, it, nothing is cut and dry. It was like, really, it was bizarre. For, <laughs> it was such a disappointment for the shadow. And for him to be the shadow, none of the, like, trademark lines, you know, no, no clouding of men's mind, no knowing what evil lo- lurks, lurks. In the hearts of men. No, nothing like that. It's just him with a hat and kind of like keeping himself turned with the collar of his coat in front of his face. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) So basically, an episode of Murder, She Wrote, is put together better and might have more of the shadow in it. (laughs) (laughs) Very possible. (laughs) Yeah. No, I just, I definitely wanted to mention that to you. I know, you know, how much of a fan of the shadow you are. And, you know, I, I, I doubt you've seen many of the old 1930s and films that were based on the character. No, I haven't. And doesn't sound like I want to. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a completist? Uh, uh, shockingly, no. <laughs> if you decide to do it, I wouldn't start with the shadow strikes. <laughs> Damn, I was looking to do these in chronological before I let you uh, ramble on, on this, about whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And speaking of superheroes, this uh, news story came up that I wanted to mention too. Are you familiar with the Max Fleischer's uh, Superman short films? Yes, of course. From the yeah 1940, early 1940s I when actually these things came out. have a copy of them on DVD. Well, you might want to upgrade these next month because these are going to be coming to Blu-ray. Oh, nice. 
And these are going to be remastered from original 35 millimeter elements of film. Very these cool. are going to look incredible because they already look good. You can dial these things like these things up on YouTube, and I think that looks pretty good. Right. And your DVD, I, I think I've got the same DVD, and I'm like, yeah, th- th- those still look pretty good. <gasps> And Blu-ray remastered, these are going to be amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, the color and line work was already amazing in them for as old as they are. Now to have it pop off the screen like that, that's going to be really cool. No, absolutely. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this set. I I think this is definitely going to be going on the uh, the short wish list. There you go. <laughs> May 16th I, uh, okay. is when they'll be coming out. Not, so not too long a wait. No, not at all. That'll be very cool. Yeah, very cool. So those are some fun stories. There's going to be uh, there's 17 shorts in all. Um, I think they're all, all relatively short. Usually only about maybe 20 minutes, maybe. I don't think they're all that long. And, and, and the thing I always found interesting about them is that was back when you could also re- almost relate a little bit more to Superman. He wasn't like all globe lifting powerful he was Mm -hmm. he had limitation Um, well these are only um i think what three years after the character had been introduced in the comics yeah so this is like the first animated look at the hero so they were definitely lifting and probably not changing too awful much from the comics no no uh, that that's what i remember liking about them is that they were pretty pure they will also be available digitally in HD on uh, Prime, Apple, Google, Vudu, and a few other services and, and, and all. And uh, the Blu-ray collection, about 34 bucks. Nice. So that isn't, isn't all, all that awful bad no. for a, a remastered Blu-ray. And for something, something like this, yeah, that is... Yeah, something that's a classic. Yeah. So definitely wanted to mention that. Very cool. That's all I've got. What uh, what you what have you been up to? Uh well, time with my son is still de- delving deep into Night Court. So <laughs> yeah, nice. I've had to take a little bit of a pause. I haven't had a chance to watch any in a while. We're steaming our way through third season now. So. Oh goodness, yeah, you're well ahead of me. Yes, uh, we've got Christine Sullivan as a permanent uh, character. Um, oh, actually, no, we did. We crossed into fourth season because we just picked up Roz. Ah, all right. There you go. But we haven't, but we only saw the first episode of the fourth season and we didn't get an ex- explanation to what happened to uh, Flo. Flo. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So waiting to hear more about that later. But uh, so other than that, I, I just started and I only just got into it knowing that the second season's about to come out. It's a series from Showtime called Yellow Jackets. Okay. The premise of Yellow Jackets is that a uh, uh, a girls' high school soccer team is going to be on its way to a championship game. They have a private jet to take them to this game. Um, the jet goes down, and then this starts emulating a little bit of, like, um, Alive, the story of the Chilean uh, uh, soccer players that were crash-landed, and then they kind of they kind of survived by also being cannibalistic. Yellow Jackets alludes to that happening, but but what I wanted to really discuss about this is the way that they tell the story. This is one of those where it's not just them as high school students. We are also seeing the characters as adults. So you're getting this layered storytelling where um, time is progressing for the characters at different points in their own age. So you're getting the drama of those that survived this crash that are still out in the world um, and who have deep secrets around what happened in their time in the wilderness while... After the crash, because the plane didn't get recovered right away. They were there, uh, if I remember correctly, in like 60 days. So so they were gone a long time. Um, And then apparently lots of things happen (laughs) during that period of time. But 
we're they're unfolding the story like we go back in time we watch some of what happens during the plane crash and then we flash forward in time to uh, them as adults and the drama that's there i like those stories where they kind of twist and turn and mingle that and then the notion that you're going to carry this over multiple seasons the writing is really good right now in what i'm watching Mm -hmm. on the first season i it starts getting into that can you sustain it? it it's like will it go the way of lost lost used to do that stuff where it would disjoint time and tell different elements from different points but then it got too popular and they ruined themselves because they had to last too long Um, yeah yeah i'm wondering if this can be a series that takes that kind of storytelling element and actually makes it work long term so and then um it actually has some big names in it uh juliette lewis and christina ricci are playing adult versions of some of the characters so it's got a great cast. It, it, it's a, it's dark. It's dark as hell. Um, and I don't mean lighting. I just mean mood. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot of fun to watch. And uh, there may be some mysticism that is going to play into this. There's a, there's a symbol that keeps showing up. And it was present on the mountain where they crashed. Uh, before they crashed. So it... Like, we don't even know why the plane went down yet. We, uh, at least not where I'm at in the uh, story. So, it, it, it's a fun watch. I think you might enjoy it. So, it, it sounds like it's a story where, in the end, you don't know what kind of story you're going to get. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because uh, it, it's kind of cute, too, from the perspective. At some stages, you're watching them as soccer players, and then later you're watching them as soccer moms. <laughs> so... <laughs> And, but none of them are very nice people necessarily. <laughs> so, uh, but it's it's a little about the what one sees on the surface isn't necessarily what you get. So, yeah, uh, excellent. Yeah, no, it's it's a fun watch. So I recommend uh, giving that a shot. And then I understand second season's about out. Oh, okay, excellent. Yep. All right. Been watching anything else? Is that it then? Then? Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Other than uh, uh, I, I am religious about uh, uh, watching the Picard episodes, and they're just so good. I finally, finally got into that. I'm uh, two episodes in, still, so I'm a little, I'm a little behind, but getting well, you're there. Not, yeah, you're not terribly far behind. This week is only number four. So. Yeah, yeah. As of recording, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not too far behind. I'm enjoying uh, some of it. I have my issues. Sure. Yeah, maybe we'll uh, we'll talk about that at the end of the season. Yeah, let's uh, we'll get through the season. Maybe we can just do a brief recap. Yeah, exactly. Sounds good. All right. Well, then we will take a short break. We'll listen to a promo for another podcast, and when we return, we will talk about the 2000 film Dungeons and Dragons. Rod Barnett. I'm the host of The Bloody Pit, the podcast that examines films from across the decades. On The Bloody Pit, we have several ongoing series of shows within the show focused on specific things in genre cinema that I and my co-hosts find fascinating. There's a long-running series focused on Italian maestro Antonio Margheriti's films from the 1960s all the way up through 1990. There's an on-again, off-again series focused on 1970s science fiction films. There's an in-depth look at the Western movies that William Castle made before he struck out on his own and became the horror auteur that we know and love. A look at the classic Coffin Joe films from Brazil, and our long-term project to look at every universal horror film made in the 1940s. That's a long project, people. It's going to take us a long time. Sprinkled in amongst those are various other episodes focused on other stranger areas of cinema, 
like uh, Lucio Fulci, Dario Argento, and even some obscure British crime films from time to time. So join me and my rotating crew of co-hosts as we examine the stranger side of cinema through an exploitation lens. Except when we don't? Yeah, you never really know exactly what to expect on The Bloody Pit. So join me for The Bloody Pit. is not fit to govern an empire. The forces of darkness. You can control dragons. With the dragon army at my command, I can crush the Empress. This has got to be some twisted magic experiment gone seriously wrong. Have threatened to conquer a kingdom. What can I do to stop Profion? If you can obtain the Rod of Savril, you could control red dragons. I suggest we lay low, let the whole thing blow over, come back, rob everybody. There, there's one small problem. Problem? I kind of committed us to find it. Let their blood rain from Asgard! Trust me. I hate when you say that! Don't touch that! Kill them slowly. You finish the maze, you win the prize. to do better than that. They must complete this task alone. You know, I love the way you track. I'll get Marina, you get the map. How you get the girl and I get a map? We gotta work out some new plans. I want them found. Do you really think you can steal my destiny? Be careful. You too. Dungeons and Dragons from 2000 is a fantasy adventure film directed by Courtney Solomon and is based on the role-playing game of the same name. Young thieves Ridley and Snails get unwittingly pulled into the political schemes of the evil sorcerer Profion. He is attempting to wrestle power away from the young Empress Savina by making her relinquish her magical scepter which allows her to control the gold dragons while he is also sending his servant, Damador, to find the Road of Savril, which would allow him to control red dragons. While trying to steal from the Sumdale Magic School, Ridley and Snails are caught by Apprentice Mage Marina just as Damador attacks to find a map that would lead him to the Rod. Ridley, Snail, Marina escape with the map and embark on a quest to find the magical talisman first and save Empress Savina and the Land of Izmir. You know, as you read that, it, I, I realize Dungeons and Dragons is already a realm where they make up lots and lots of words. But as you read that out, <laughs> it's kind of hard to go. Yeah, none of that makes any sense. <laughs> 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 You're just making crap up, man. <laughs> I, I I feel I felt like it even when I was typing. I had to go and like double check you know, <laughs> things. Now, I got a little bit of backstory about this film Ooh, and the, in the production here. Uh, Courtney Solomon, a Dungeons & Dragons player himself, started his own quest to produce a film based uh, on the game uh, beginning in 1990. He managed to obtain an option from TSR Incorporated, the then owner of the game, after writing a 30-page proposal on how he would adapt the game. Several studios in the past had tried but failed in the eyes of TSR to capture the game's essence. Solomon began writing the script in 91 based on the rules of the second edition of the basic D&D game. The class of characters and the rules of Dungeons & Dragons are all brought to the film. 
Solomon created a generic setting only loosely based on one of the lesser-known game settings, Nistara. Once the screenplay was completed, he spent the next 18 months going around the world to find funding for the film. Hong Kong businessman Alan Zeman and Solomon formed Sweet Pea Entertainment to fund the film and began seeking other investors. They originally imagined this film to be a $100 million epic. Filmmakers like Francis Ford Coppola, James Cameron, and Stan Winston were at different times attached to the film. Executive producer Joel Silver joined the effort in 97, which allowed the film to obtain more investors, but he envisioned a TV series rather than a film. But the new rights holders of the game, Wizards of the Coast, wouldn't allow it. The plan changed to a $3.5 million direct-to-video film, and the production moved to Prague in order to utilize cheaper filming costs and have medieval locations. Solomon became the director and filmed a three-minute battle scene as a test. Joel Silver was so impressed by it that he managed to find an additional $30 million for the budget, and it once again moved to a theatrical film. And as this never had any actual studio backing, Dungeons and Dragons was the most expensive independent film made at that time. Oh my. So, yeah, there was quite a quest and a journey to even get this film produced at all. I thought that was honestly the effort that went in behind the film is probably more of a story than the actual film itself. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, that's far more fascinating than what I watched. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to see a movie on, based on that quest to get this film made. Well, and, and it's it's fantastic that you state it in that way, because that sounds more like a Dungeons & Dragons adventure than the film. <laughs> Uh, the film stars Justin Whalen as Ridley, Marlon Wayans as Snails. We have a Zoe McClellan as Marina, Jeremy Irons as Profion, and Bruce Payne as Damador. We also have Thora Birch as Empress Savina, and Tom Baker does make like a one-minute appearance as Halvarth the Elf. Yeah, I, I find it funny. Uh, he actually made it into the credits at the end, like he was presented as like one of the primary actors in the film even though he's only in there for about two three minutes yeah and, and imdb didn't even bother to put him on the page <laughs> you gotta you gotta click the all button to get to tom baker i think this was a first watch for me i have never seen this f film ever i never want to see it again uh, <laughs> uh not to bury the lead but <laughs> but as I'm watching it, I heard Tom Baker more than I saw him at first because he's in his elf makeup. Um, his hair is kind of shorn. He's in mm -hmm. lots of cloaks. He's got his pointy ears and his head's all down while he's busy treating um, our hero Ridley. And he starts to speak, and it's the only moment in the whole entire film where I perked up. I'm like, ooh, I know that voice. <laughs> and he starts talking. Hello, Ridley. How did you do that? The elven peoples do not require spells to work with magic. You use magic. We are part of it. We are part of magic. As are all living creatures, including dragons. Sadly, humans see only their destructive powers. Shh. I had a dream. I saw... You saw a dragon being born. It was amazing. Life was exploding all around. So it should. You see, when dragons are born, they bring new magic with them. Magic is the life force of our world. It keeps nature and everything around us in balance. Any dragon should die. Oh, life would wither as it must. And the balance would be destroyed. The road. You and your countrymen are very close to irreparably destroying the fabric of magic with this rod you seek. The rod. 
is man-made, unnatural. It must not be disturbed. Shh. You must rest. And he's the he's the character with the most or, or uh, the best lines. <laughs> like what he says while he's speaking is more Dungeons and Dragons than anything anybody else said during the film. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That's the beginning of like, all right. There's there's story here. Let's 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 yeah. go with that. Let's go with that. No, no. Nope. We say goodbye. <laughs> yeah, no. I I wanted to go down the path that he started to lead, and we abandoned it immediately. Yeah. So unfortunately, I couldn't remember if I have watched this film before. I watched the trailer, and there's so much of it that looked familiar to me. But I don't know if I just watched the trailer before or if I tried to watch this film before and even after watching the film I still don't know <laughs> yeah as I asked friends about this film uh the most I got out of them uh, they're like is that one of the ones with the weigh-ins in it <laughs> that's one of them anyway in there yeah he is and his character is problematic at best. I, I watch a lot of films from the 30s and 40s. Yeah. Many of those films have the African-American uh, chauffeur or butler yeah. that is played for the uh, comic relief of the film. Sure. That is Snails. Yeah. Uh, I, I found his lines, his presence, his character kind of offensive. Yeah, no, very offensive uh, for me. I I was uncomfortable watching him, and that, all I could think of was, was some of these old films, and you know the African American with the doing the big bug eyes and oh boss, run! Oh, it was. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it it was nails on a chalkboard, kind of bad. I wasn't sorry when that character met his fate. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then uh, as we get toward the end of the film, them teasing that maybe he's not dead. Like, oh, crap. It's already terrible that he that we had the character. Please don't allude to him being more than he was. They did actually make it some uh, direct-to-video sequel, but I don't think it had any of the uh, original characters other than, uh, I think, Damador does return. Mm. But I think everyone else is a, a different character. But um, had they continued, and I mean, they envisioned this thing to be like a big franchise. Sure. This was going to be the first of maybe three films or more. Maybe they could have recast them <laughs> you know, for the second film and, you know, been able to some magical reason why he looks and acts different. Well, thank God that never happened. But I mean, with his character and the way they did it, and really all of the characters. He kind of felt more like like a Beastmaster 2 than, than anything. These all fe seem like characters that came out of another land and then were forced into this. They didn't act or mm -hmm. behave like this was the place that they grew up in with the things that happen on a daily basis in this kind of environment. My impression of this film... And this is very strange because I read that uh, Courtney Solomon, I think it was with uh, Joel Silver or someone else that he was uh, courting to direct or something, mm -hmm. actually watched a bunch of 80s action adventure films. <laughs> okay. The, 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 the sword and sorcery films that the 80s was kind of rife with. Yeah. You know, the the, the crawl, the, the Lady Hawk, yeah. um, you know, all that. As examples of um, how it's done poorly and how they're going to do it better. Weirdly enough, I feel like this film is absolutely at home with all those 1980s films. This is this is absolutely Beastmaster. This is the Blade Master. This is Crawl. All these films, and even our star Justin Whalen, again. Completely at home in a 1980s movie. If this movie was done in the 1980s, it would probably be like a 
beloved cult classic. It, I, yeah, and, and it would be the the fact that it was made in two thousand um, is is the part that makes it the travesty that it kind of is. So like, it's funny that you say that they went to watch those to see what not to do, and then did it worse. And even stranger when you put it in context that the first Lord of the Rings film is one year later. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I, I, I grant that they did not get the budget. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, that's that true. Lord of the Rings got. Um, but they didn't do much with what they did have. I was really hoping to get some, um, some insight from some D&D &D players and stuff about... Right how far or how close you know the the characterizations and the events or the uh, maybe not the events but certainly the the settings of the film matched with the uh, the original role playing game and i wasn't able to to get anything uh terribly insightful <laughs> i mean the fact that Courtney Solomon was a player and he right. wanted to true and he based a lot of things but i also read that he was uh because of a lot of uh, just machinations and time and and budget constraints and everything, he ended up having to go with a script that wasn't as um, faithful as he would like. So yeah, I'm I, I'm just not sure. I I'm not a D and D player. I never have been. I remember trying to sit in on a game once and find it it found it intolerably boring. Uh, <laughs> So I'm not sure. Maybe is it is this something that can't be brought to screen? Which I, I guess we're going to find out here in a couple of weeks as the new film uh, debuts. I was just having this conversation with some someone, and I love th this is what bothers me about Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and, and my son is getting into Dungeons and Dragons right now. Um, and one of the components that he likes about it and that I understand about it is at its heart, it's it's storytelling. It, it, mm -hmm. That's the point of becoming a dungeon master is to tell your own tale and have people move through the scenario that you ha have developed around this story that you want to tell. And the fact that this movie didn't succeed to tell a story... <laughs> <laughs> was kind of, was kind of disappointing, and, um, and yeah, no, it's kind of funny with the uh, new one coming out. I think isn't it even like this weekend coming out? It may be, yeah, it may be the the week of uh, of, of recording. I'm yeah. only gonna throw this out here as a little fun thing. I don't know if there's any reality to this or if somebody's deep faking some stuff online, but they're hinting at. Um, quick glimpses of characters in this new movie that would be the characters from the animated series. Oh, I have heard something about that. I, I saw a little clip where the, the, the barbarian kid, I don't remember any of the characters' names. Um, Bobby. I think it was Bobby. Bobby That's sounds all right. I know. Um, <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it looked like Bobby in his, uh, in his fur pelt outfit with his horned helmet is rooting through uh, a a, uh, um, a crate getting his axe out that it was given that was given to him um, club and, or whatever it was yeah, yeah and then uh, the guy that was the archer is in his green um, mm -hmm. outfit and he's pulling Bobby along and there's a sh there's a shot where they're on either end of a long um, cobblestone path with high walls and the new characters are on one side the old characters are on on the other they glimpse each other and then go in separate directions <laughs> i that'll be very cute if that is actually in the film i it wouldn't surprise me but that would at least be more than what we got out of this <laughs> yeah yeah speaking of characters um the character marina yes the mage yes absolutely pointless yes <laughs> she truly had no business in this film they, they gave her absolutely nothing to do other than to be captured and be rescued yep again so 1980s 
Oh, absolutely. It, it, it was pandering. Um, she's the complete damsel, even though she's supposed to be a mage. Um, who doesn't use any flipping magic. Apparently, you have to have the you have to have a bag of sand in order to do your magic in this world. Oh well, yeah, and, and there there was a potential um, message in this uh, because they kept occasionally alluding to. Um, a society of haves and have-nots. If you're mages, um, you're 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 the upper crust of society, and if you're a commoner, you are literally that a commoner. You don't you don't rate. You don't have any skill, any power. You're lucky mm-hmm. if you get to eat. Um, so, and that's kind of the world they painted this to be. I don't know how if that sticks with anything related to Dungeons and Dragons, but. Uh, um, but then they set this course where this empress was going to be the beacon of light that would bring uh, freedom to everyone. And what that had to do with the story they were trying to tell also doesn't entirely fit. No, not not freedom, equality. equality. Everyone should be equal. Right. And the end of the film, she decrees, you're all equal. I'm like, oh, well. Well, yeah. That, that's solved. That solves everything. <laughs> so we all get to move into the castle. Yeah. When's dinner? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Somehow I don't see it going down that way, but I, that's what I'm saying is they 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 set out to have a point that they never actually followed through on. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure why they kept bringing that up, other than that that's the creates the threat for Profion. Or well, right. Yeah. He just doesn't want to give that up. But I mean. But we don't even understand what exactly is he losing, right? So everyone, so she declares everyone equal. What does that happen to? He's still, you know, the a powerful mage. mage. Yeah. So what? What does he lose? Well, and that's her 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 point on equality. These are mages, and again, they have abilities, powers, spells. Um, all sorts of things that can allow you to do any sorts of wonderful, miraculous stuff, and everybody else doesn't. And what's even funnier about that is we do get into a couple of environments where they do introduce other creatures and beings and all of that, but it's unclear how they fit into this whole mages versus commoners kind of thing. So... I, it, it, it all it all rings hollow. <laughs> yeah, I know they uh, definitely tried to squeeze in some better known characters. There's the the, the beholders. Yeah, aren't those the balls with the eyes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I definitely feel like that's kind of like a uh, a creature from D and D that everyone would recognize, and so they pretty much shoehorn them in so they can just be there. They don't do anything, right? But they're there. Yeah, it showed up about three quarters of the way f- through the film. Um, there was no interaction with it other than you saw it and it wandered off to go look for something. Yeah. Because somebody threw a rock. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> the, the, tel- the, the tried and true rock, because that fools all of them. I, as I understand it, the, the creature that Damador puts into... Um... Oh, what was his? Or no, uh, the, the, that Profion puts into Damador yeah. is another creature from D&D, but it's not visualized as the actual creature is in the in the role-playing game. Yeah, there, there's also some little, like these little uh, albino pixie guys that keep showing up here and there, and I believe they are characters out of D&D, but uh, yeah, again, they don't really, they're not relevant to this movie, they just they're on screen right and there was a, a, a lot of creatures when they go to the bars and and the and the uh you know sure uh, different places there's all kinds of different creatures so i'm i'm guessing someone who is more more well versed in the game might have a a fun time picking out uh, these these creatures and characters that you know that are from the from the role-playing game but yeah I kind of got the impression that during the uh, the scene in the City of Thieves, uh, mm-hmm. where our hero Ridley has to go find uh, the the ruby um, at the center of a maze, 
I, I, I figured that's the part where we were supposed to start rolling dice. <laughs> <laughs> Does he make it? I don't know. Roll the dice. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, absolutely. I, you know, and that's actually pretty surprising that that wasn't worked into the film at all. Since I mentioned that they all seemed like they were out of place, and that's actually one of the things that kind of made the old cartoon series kind of work, is um, the characters in that story literally were out of place. They came from our world. They ended up in the D&D world literally through a portal. They were completely out, fish out of water, and they played that up. This could have been an excellent opportunity to kind of do more of that. We are people who are in this situation and now have to think our way through it. And I don't know if you throw in a dice element of some kind, but that would have been even cool if uh, just like the magic dust that's in the bags looked more like dice. Yeah. Well, I was, you know, you could have worked it in about, you know, what, um, what tasks would really have to face in the maze. So you could have the guy, you know, rolling the dice and, Oh, sorry, you rolled a, but not you know, you know something right no you could have worked in stuff like that uh i mean we i don't know that every dungeons and dragons thing needs to allude to a dungeon master uh, of a sort but someone telling the tale wouldn't have been a bad way to go like literally having somebody a voiceover talk you through what's happening would have been very fitting for the to- what this is <laughs> yeah yeah some sort of narrator to introduce the film and you know and to help sort of connect i mean there's a there's a scene there's a moment in the film when uh ridley and marina get sucked into a map and disappear for like five ten minutes of the film mm-hmm. and then come back and they tell us that you know they've made an agreement that they're going to go and search for this rod of savril and like what the hell happened? Where were they? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, and, and I think that's... And, and it is hopefully something the new film overcomes. It's not... D&D is popular globally and has been for decades. However, it is not so mainstream that literally any audience member will know what you're talking about. And when you're trying to get put out a film you want to reach as many people as possible and when you don't give them any information <laughs> like this this is a movie that requires some exposition or some narration or something i need something to hang my hat on you lose a little bit of um faithfulness to the game in order to make it accessible to people like ourselves yeah you know Maybe that's not such a bad thing. No, you don't want to lose it completely. No, and is in all adaptations, it, it's do you take the spirit of what you're trying to do with you? If you can do that successfully and build in enough elements to to um, appease the fans, you can be a little liberal with where you go with these things. But yeah, you got to have a path, and, and that is one thing that is very D and D. You have to have a path. This one didn't seem to have one. <laughs> But just to tie it into our to our theme, I will admit, for the money that they they spent, which wasn't a great deal for a, a you know, an adventure film like this. Right. I thought the effects and I thought the film itself it did look pretty. I liked the, the costuming, um, the cast, aside from snails maybe, <laughs> which is was just so offensive that even if he was a handsome man, I. I wouldn't be able to count them. I thought the cast looked good. Um, uh, a little bit of it, especially the Empress, honestly, she reminded me, take a few years into the future, she reminded me of like a Malta from uh, the Star Wars prequels. Oh, Amadala? Amadala, thank you. Actually, she was striking me even more as... Um a, a slightly older version of the Empress from Neverending Story. Yes. No, absolutely. The very, yeah. For a while there, I was even kind of going, is that the same girl? <laughs> <laughs> she got a, uh, they, they've got a similar look. Yeah, no, that's a good point. 
So yeah, no, I I I thought the film actually looked pretty good. I, I'm gonna respectfully disagree with with you there. All right, um, that that was one thing I was struggling with because uh, knowing our theme, um, I'm like this doesn't even look pretty. Um, oh no, the, see, I I thought if nothing else, I thought the the effects weren't too bad. Uh, the actual filming in uh, in Prague with the uh, the actual medieval. Uh, castles and stuff, I think, definitely benefited the film. When you get down to the ground level, some of that was okay. Uh, I didn't have a problem with a lot of the effects at that stage. But if you went bigger, uh, the CGI was awful. The dragons, they all of the dragons were literally the same dragon. Even when we brought in the red ones... They mm-hmm. were red versions of the same thing. A little, uh, a little uh, dragon demic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Uh, James the Wind would be proud. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, no, this that it was just really rough. The dragon seemed pointless, um, and since I mean it's Dungeons and Dragons, and to get your dragons wrong is kind of terrible. But mm-hmm. they're also pointless. Like, uh, it it was unclear what controlling them entailed or why one would want to. We right. saved it to the end. Um, even if you want to be the master of everything and you don't want equality for all people, what is the point of controlling the Red Ones to burn down everything? Then you don't have control of anything. Right. So the the purpose of the dragons seemed very off. It just we wanted a cool aerial battle at some point and this was how we were going to do it. Yeah. So yeah, and yeah, like as we were and we said before, the motivation of our main villain is questionable. Mm-hmm. Um even even our hero who is apparently more than just the the rogue, you know, maybe he's got some, you know, mage qualities or something. He, you know, he's got some destiny and you know, he's he's holding the, the, the scepter aloft and it, it glows and someone's like, oh, how can that be? Like, what? Yeah, What's nothing happening? happened. Uh, I, I, I guess the red dragons kind of stopped. Did they? Yeah, I, that's I, what I was kind of unclear. Like, the tide had turned when he held it, but it wasn't clear how. It just right. kind of happened. Yeah, and then he, no, I'm not going to be like you, and he breaks it. And I'm like, what? is going on here you brought up costuming i can't let you off the hook without mentioning the biker outfit that they put him in at the end of the film oh (laughs) (laughs) i didn't i didn't that's not how i describe it but okay no come on man they had his hair greased back he might as well have been out of grease they, they did have him like in the it black leather. It was a leathers. white shirt and a bl- short black jacket with black pants and all of it way too damn tight. And you're like, all right, sha na na, dude. <laughs> I, I was thinking he looked more like he should uh, be signing on with the cast of uh, Ice Pirates, but. Well, that works too. But <laughs> Again, taking it back to the 80s. But yeah, all of a sudden his kind of roguish look now turns into this too tight, slick kind of thing, and they're like, oh god, <laughs> just I, I I I could vomit at that moment, and that's the moment when they allude to maybe snails is okay, maybe he's alive. We're gonna go find him. <laughs> yeah. And that part made zero sense too. I, I assume that was supposed to be the lead into a sequel at some. Yes, point. yes, but a, a sequel that did not happen, at least not in the form that it was probably intended. A, as I said, a direct to uh, video sequel was made, but none of the original characters, other than uh, Bruce Payne, uh, Damador appears. So, and then uh, while on just the t- costuming stuff. Uh, why did the elf girl's uh, um, armor have a belly button on it? I didn't notice. <laughs> it did. She was another useless character. Right, uh, but I mean, they were kind of giving her this mystique, this presence, and then they didn't use it to any effect whatsoever. 
You right. could have lift like you said, she the pointless that you could have lifted her out of the entire thing. She contributed nothing. Yeah, no, this was a very misogynistic film for for a film that's coming onto the 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 cusp of the kind of like the uh, the Me Too uh, generation and everything. It's it's so backwards. Oh, it is, and, and this is where actually it does break with anything D and D. I I saw the point right up to then. It's clear that they're putting together their party through the movie, and that part is very D and D. The char- the various characters are coming together to go on their quest to so- solve the the mystery or save the day. Whatever uh, is the goal. However, when we get to the part where they should be acting as a team, a strange force field prevents everybody from attending other than our hero Ridley. That is totally not D&D. They should be there to support each other. That's the way the game works. I'm not even a big follower, and I know you're getting this wrong. (laughs) Well, should we see what some other people had to think about this film? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, we did not get a whole lot of uh, comments or anything anywhere. We got a few posts or just a couple lines here and there on Facebook. Uh, Cameron Sullivan just types in, (laughs) amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Take that as you will. (laughs) Uh, Rick Ives, of course, uh, who we just spoke to, you know, filmmaker and and now friend of of the show. Says, I've never forgotten those blue lips. <laughs> Talking about Damador's makeup. Yeah, we didn't even discuss that. That was so off putting. <laughs> yeah, it was a little. It, and they, depending on the scene, sometimes they were more blue were than other th- times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Steve Sullivan. And I was really hoping for some, uh, some real insight from him. He actually worked for TSR at one point. Oh, wow. Okay. And I, but uh, did not get anything really out of him. He says, see if you can spot the moment during the film where Dragon Lance writer Margaret Wise and I turned to each other and said, to grandmother's house we go. <laughs> not entirely sure where he meant about that, but... Uh, and he also says that a, uh, a morbid part of me wants to watch it again. Surely it can't be as bad as I remember. He said, I thought the second one was pretty good, especially in comparison. So that's interesting. The made-for-TV or made-for-video one, maybe he is actually better. Hmm. Uh, he says, as we went into the theater, Gary Gygax, who was one of the co-creators of Dungeons and Dragons, was coming out. How was it? We asked. He smiled and gave a thumbs up. But we were in public, so what else could he have done? <laughs> I never did. I never did talk to him about it later, though. The second one had an interview with him on the disc. Oh, okay, interesting. That would be worth it to catch that. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Rod Barnett says, I have never forgotten how bad this was. Wow, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Creed just goes, ah, D, 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 D. do 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 Cameron Sullivan did ask if we were already fans of Bruce Payne, and I had to reply that this is the first time I think I've seen him in a film. So, no, actually, I wouldn't say I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, yeah, and if it, this is uh, your example of him, uh, that's, yeah, probably not. Yeah. Um, and a, a newer member to the group, Mara Page, uh, says, I think I actually watched this one on HBO. Now I'm going to have to go back and find a copy. How dare you? <laughs> don't do oh, it. Don't do it, Mara. Stay look away. with us, Lord. It's fine. Look, look away, Mara. Look away. Uh, yeah, that's all. That's all the comments we got. I, as I said, I, I did try to reach out to like some Dungeons and, and uh, Dragons players and stuff, like on Reddit and mm-hmm. whatever. But I, I didn't get any meaningful uh, response. In fact, I got some actual rude responses, which doesn't paint a terribly good picture of Dungeons and Dragons players. But I'm assuming he was in the minority. I, I would put that more in Reddit user maybe than D and D player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that is not the place to go. Reddit's not where you go for friendly conversation necessarily. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, the people that complain about the uh, the people on Twitter have never spent any time on Reddit. That's my experience. <laughs> yeah, Twitter's where you go for political folly. Reddit's where you go for just everything else. Yes. But anyway, so that's all we've got from uh, from listeners and friends of the show. On to so the professionals. What? Yes, please. Um, 
And, and I'm just going to rocket through some of these uh, notes because everybody's stuff comes off as one liners for the most part. <laughs> so uh, from the Miami Herald, Charles Savage actually put this uh, more in the middle range of uh, enjoyable a splashy, silly movie that inexplicably stars Jeremy Irons, but will delight 10-year-old boys across the realm. Regrettably, the hordes of pre-adolescent boys it would have, had, would have delighted most were that age 20 years ago. <laughs> so. You know, I did read Jeremy Irons originally wasn't interested in doing the film. He finally came around, I think, after... I think after Joel Silver yeah. signed on as executive producer, and at the time Jeremy Irons was actually rehabbing a castle, oh, okay. so he need he needed the paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of uh, from Jaws four or whatever Michael Caine. Yeah, the whole uh, if they ask him if have you ever seen the movie, he's like no, but I've seen the house I bought my mom. <laughs> <laughs> it, you gotta. That's ultimately we've been down this road before. Uh, you, you're an actor getting paid. You don't always get to pick the thing that gets you paid. <laughs> exactly. So you go with what's in front of you. <laughs> Continuing on, film.com. Jenna file Gemma files puts good intentions, bad writing. Uh, <laughs> the Washington Post. Uh, Rita Kempley. Stinketh like <laughs> the breath of a dyspeptic dragon. <laughs> wow. Oh, dyspeptic dragon. I'm sorry I mispronounced that. <laughs> so, like I said, one-liners galore. Film.com again. Ernest Hardy. Horribly slapdash affair. Uh, the Austin Chronicle. Uh, Mark Savlov. This dragon sladly is DOA. <laughs> <laughs> And then our friend uh, Roger Ebert, I love pulling his stuff, uh, gave it an amazing one and a half stars. Uh, might have still been a little generous with that half. Um, he starts off with Dungeons and Dragons. Looks like they threw away the game and photographed the box it came in. <laughs> it's an amazing movie to look at in its odd way. But close your eyes and the dialogue sounds like an overwrought junior high school play. <laughs> The plot does not defy description. It discourages it. <laughs> <laughs> I love that final line. Yeah, and then if you go into the final paragraph, which I'm not going to read, but he just really meanders over the whole what the hell was with the dragons thing because <laughs> he, he, he wanted to know more about them but didn't get anything. They're all over the place. They look like hell. <laughs> just, yeah talking and reading i just i kind of dialed up like 80s uh, sword and sorcery films and i'm sitting here looking you know excalibur dragon slayer conan the barbarian sword and the sorcerer beast master death stalker crawl <laughs> i'd rather go watch any of those rather than uh, watch dungeons and dragons again <laughs> yeah and, and and if you think about it, a lot of them they didn't have a budget either but they pulled off what they were trying to do a lot better or even the ones that didn't, they're still, like, the campy, bad fun. Yeah. I, I can't even say that about this one. And, and I'm sorry, and I tend to find a positive in, in most, but, I mean, I, I really don't want to go watch this ever again. There was nothing, there was no scene that I'm like, oh, well, that was at least cute. Let me go, Tom Baker, uh, there you go, I, I have... I, Where's my Ram chip? I, I, I said something positive about the film. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you got a, a five-minute scene that you can you can yeah, watch and remember fondly. Legitimately, Tom Baker lit up the film for a second because he actually gave it like some hope, and then we were quickly dashed right after that. <laughs> yes. All right, so is that all you got from uh, the critics then? Y yes. That's I, it? I, okay. To get, di dip in any further, we'll only get worse. Okay, that's a no one liked it. Nope. <laughs> All right, well, that will do it for this episode. Um, if you have any additional thoughts on Dungeons and Dragons from 2000, please let us know. Come to any of the social medias, follow the link in the show notes, and uh, leave us a comment or send us an email at timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com. Next episode, the film that 
most likely inspired this entire series of, well, it looked pretty. <laughs> We're going to look at 2003's League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I'm excited to actually sit down and talk about this film, and I'm excited the fact to have an excuse to watch it again. This is actually one of these films where, well, I guess we should get into it too deep. We'll right. talk about it more in a couple weeks. Absolutely. But yes, no, this should be a fun conversation and a nice revisit for both of us. Excellent. Uh, until then, thanks very much for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you in a couple weeks. Bye. See ya.